Hello everybody and welcome back to Q&A Wednesdays. We have got quite the list for you today, so thank you very much everybody for making your submissions. Before we make a start though, I just want to say again thank you to all of our patron supporters and all of you new subscribers. We've had a huge increase in subscribers recently and it's all down to you guys, so thank you once again. If you would like to ask a question to us in the future um, and absolutely guarantee that it will be answered, head over to our Patreon page, we'll leave a link below. And basically we answer all of the questions on Patreon. It's it's why we have the Patreon page there, so we can give you um, the advice that you need. Um, on social media, on Facebook and Instagram, we put the question out also for the Q&A Wednesdays, and we will respond to one question on Instagram and on Facebook. So without further ado, let's get straight into it. Our first question is from George Walker. Hi there, thanks for the videos. They've been really useful so far. I've been doing up a Renault traffic following your vids and have finished the walls in carpet and fitted a ply floor. Just wondering if you have any suggestions for how to finish a couple of areas. The first is the sliding door step, which is lower than the rest of the floor and leaves an area exposed. I've seen there are some aftermarket steps available, but wondered if you had another suggestion. The second is about a meeting of the wall, is about the meeting of the wall carpet and the floor. We've got carpet down to the bottom and an outro floor to go down. Is there any trim or finish you use to protect the lower part of the wall from muddy bikes and shoes, etc., and to stop sand, etc., going down the gap between the floor and wall? Sorry for the long message. Thanks again, George in Cornwall. Two-part question then. The sliding door step. Now I know on the Renault Traffic slash Vauxhall Vivaro, the side step is kind of a funny area. And we built one last year, so I know exactly what you're going on about. Now, when it came to that sidestep area, what we actually did was we warmed up the outro contracts floor and pressed it down to fit the curvature of the um, step and the metalwork surrounding the step. And then we put a, I think we put the original plastic step down and what that makes is a smooth transition from the floor layer down to the side step layer. I think what we also did, we routed a nice um, edge into the edge of the ply floor as well. So it would make that transition rather than a hard, sharp 90 degree edge on the edge of that side step. Um, we beveled the edge with a router. So it'd actually be a really nice smooth transition from the height of the floor into the height of the step. And there's not much difference, it's only like a couple of inches. Um, but that made for a nice uh, smooth floor leading down onto that step. Hope that helps. Um, second part of the question, um, generally we would make sure the floor fits very close to the walls and the carpeted areas of the walls. If you are still worried about the gap that may be left, what we've seen, in fact, our very own Dan, what he's done to join that gap between the floor and the wall is actually put uh, like a nice nylon rope or sisal rope um, as an edging um, that's stuck to basically where the floor meets the wall. So it gives you a nice sort of beading around the edge. And I guess you could use anything similar like that, a nice hessian or sisal type rope, or even um, a more modern looking, say, climbing rope, for example. Uh, but generally, we would make sure that there is a very, very close fit between the Altro contracts floor and the carpet on the side wall of the van. Our second question is from Matt Bristow. Hi Lee, hope everyone is well and busy on their lockdown projects. I have been working on converting a T5 from an electrician van, electrician's van to a combi copy for transporting my scooters to rallies. Just the floor to put in now, I have lifted the factory ply and checked for nails and screws and touched up any bare metal. My intention is to reinstate the marine ply floor and finish with a laminate snap together type flooring which is harder wearing for the scooters. The laminate flooring says it needs an underlay. In which order would you build up from bare metal to laminate flooring, including insulation, sound deadening and ply flooring? Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Lee. Right. Um, when it comes to a T5, you are very fortunate in that the um, 
the ribs in the floor pressing are actually quite shallow. Um, so what you can do is put a nine mil ply down in between those ribs to be able to, if you, yeah, to be able to lay your new plywood floor on top of that. So bond some ply strips down onto the metalwork, fill in the gaps between those ply battens with um, the dead mat duo, which you can get again from our website, we can leave a link below. Then you can screw and or bond your new ply or reused ply floor onto those ply strips. Um, alternatively, you can screw that ply floor directly onto a metal floor that has been lined with dead mat duo. So, dead mat duo, ply floor, screw directly on top. Alternatively, ply battens between the ribs of the metal pressing. Fill the gaps in between those with the sound deadening, dead mat duo, and then you ply floor on top. Again, screwed down and or um, use a bonding, such as a polyurethane bonding. Um, on top of that, to put your laminate floor, I believe an underlay is used in homes to counteract slightly different layers of floor that you're gonna put your laminate on. I've not used it in a van before, I've not used an underlay in a van before, but I have used laminate type flooring in a van. And to be honest with you, Matt, I would, rec I would not recommend a click together laminate type floor. I would recommend covering that ply floor now with an Altro Contracts flooring, which it, they come in maybe 30, 40 different color and pattern variations. Um, you can get them pre-cut to fit if you need to. And it's a really hard wearing floor surface. In fact, it's designed to go in public utility areas such as toilets and hospitals and things like that. So I would move away from the laminate flooring um, purely because if, if you're using it to transport scooters and things like that, you can get maybe some water, some dirt, maybe some, even some oil in between those laminate um, sections and once that is in there in between those gaps it's just going to expand your floor i put laminate floor in my van bully when i first got him and i wish i never did to be honest because um, once those edges are raised you then wear them and it's just it's a patchy looking floor now so i'd steer clear from that if i were you um next question well thanks anyway for your question matt next question is from lee roberts hi lee i'm looking i'm thinking of adding central locking to my t4 do you have any recommendations for specific kit as all I can find online look cheaply made and any tips? Cheers, Lee. The only kit I have used for a T4 central locking system and a kit that I'd be happy to refit again is the one that's offered by Traveling Light. We will put a link down below to their website. Um, it's a comprehensive kit. I believe you can choose to have just the cab doors central locking or you can have all of the doors controlled by FOB central locking. Um, not the cheapest of kits, um, but actually a very good kit. And it does come with some pretty good instructions. So yeah, Traveling Light, T4 central locking kit, they're the ones I would recommend. John Harkness, Lee, do you still learn from others on the internet, Instagram or YouTube accounts, etc.? If so, do you have any recommendations for design, inspiration, modifications that you don't or won't cover? There are huge amounts of um, YouTube channels and Instagram pages and Pinterest pictures that I follow. Um, I don't really watch regular TV. I will watch YouTube and I will watch those shows that actually interest me rather than the rubbish they put on general telly. In terms of design, inspiration, and modifications that I don't or won't cover. One that is really good, uh, an Instagram account that is really good, is one called OTG Camper, at OTG Camper. Now, he's US-based, and he works primarily on motorhomes, but what he does do is huge, comprehensive um, electrical installations using all Victron gear. So he will have a huge 30, 40-foot motorhome, and um, put solar panels on, power management systems, and it's absolutely impeccable. His wiring and his battery management skills and everything else, really, really good. Um, in terms of YouTube channels I follow, I don't really follow any other YouTube channels in terms of camper vans. 
Um, I do follow the likes of Project Amber, who we've spoken about before. He's got a really, really good story, um, and his build's really cool in his ambulance-based camper van conversion. But in terms of entertainment, I watch Roadkill, which is presented by Mike Finnegan and David Freiberger over in America. Um, Mighty Car Mods, Marty and Moog, they're the guys who are based in Australia. They kind of got me into the whole YouTube game. Um, in terms of just general um, mechanics, I watch a channel called Musty One. And again, all of these links I'll put down below. And in terms of carpentry, I watch and follow a guy called John Malecki on Instagram. Anybody who knows anything about wood might actually follow John Malecki. He's pretty big in the Instagram game as well. Um, but in terms of inspiration, I look a lot at Pinterest as well because there are some excellent, excellent pictures that other converters have put up. But generally, I get a lot of feedback from you guys, all of you who are tagging us in your uh, build photos and follow us and then sharing everything with me. I'm just blown away by the interiors you guys are coming up with and the designs and everything else. So keep them coming, keep tagging me in the pictures. I absolutely love it and I do follow them and I do put a thumbs up or a heart or whatever it is on Instagram. Um, but no, I love seeing all of your projects. So keep on tagging us in the photos. Our next question is from Emma Lloyd. Thank you very much, Emma. In fact, Emma's van is with us at the moment having a bit of remedial work. Emma says, hi, I was wondering about solar panels. Are they a good investment and how do I know which set to buy? Now, open question. Once again, I think we discussed this in the last Q&A. It depends completely on your requirements and the utilities you have within your camper van or motorhome as to what um, wattage of solar panels and or power management you go with. If you're only using a compressor fridge and maybe a couple of USBs, you want to go for a slightly smaller solar panel but it would be unfair for me to give you specific figures and sizes because every van's different and every user requirement is different as well. But um, yes, they are a good investment because if you're uh, what they call wild camping and you have no hookup or anything like that, then solar panels are great for keeping your battery topped up for days and days. So that is all the Patreon questions answered. Thank you very much, everybody, for asking. We are going to head over to Facebook now. Bear with us one second. And our Facebook question is from Darren Strong. Darren says, thanks for the video tutorials. They've been a massive help. I'm just about to start converting my long wheelbase transit uh, I'm just about to start converting my long wheelbase transit. Current budget doesn't allow fitting a shower or solar panels, but I would like to in the future. What can I do whilst the van is stripped back to bare bones to make retrofitting these as easy as possible in the future? Thanks in advance. So if you have a good idea of where you want the shower located, maybe just run some pipe work first. Have a look at which pump you might be running in the future. Have a look at the shower heads you may be using in the future and maybe even the shower, shower controller. Have a look at all those parts and make a plan as to where you want to put them and maybe just run some pipes for the time being because pipes can easily be cut and easily be joined um, or run some trunking that is going to be big enough to fit your water pipes through in the future. It's all about the prior planning. Um, you know about the five Ps. I'm not gonna go into it. In fact, prior planning prevents piss poor performance. So as long, it's an old army phrase, as long as you plan well as to where you want your shower, then yes, you can make, take preventative measures to make the installation easier down the line. And that goes the same with the electric side as well. You can run trunking through to where you may want your solar panel wiring located. And once you've got some trunking in place, have a spare cable or a piece of string um, kept within that trunking. So when it comes to wiring your solar panel in later, you just connect the solar panel wiring to that string and then you can pull that string all the way through the trunking and your cable should follow. Therefore, you can keep um, all of your solar panel cables hidden. So yes, again, prior, prevention, prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Not that you're gonna be piss poor, but you know what I'm saying. 
Last question then from Instagram is, bear with this one second, from Lisa and Aid. Uh, Lisa and Aid, I believe they've asked a question before, and it's quite a simple one today. Why is your company called Coombe Valley? Now, when I started the business, or first came up with the idea for doing the business in 2015, I lived uh, in Bexhill, and I lived in an area called Pebsham, and the area of natural beauty behind that area was called the Coombe Valley Park, or the Coombe Valley, um, what's the name of it, Dan? Nature Reserve. The Coombe Valley Nature Reserve, that's it. The Coombe Valley Nature Reserve. And I like the idea of a double-barreled name, um, and I, one of the other reasons why it was called Coombe Valley is because there is a new uh, road between two towns where I live, and it's called the Coombe Valley Way. When they built that road, they said they were gonna be building some brand new industrial units on there. So I thought, you know, the five-year plan, have a business called Coombe Valley Campers, located on the Coombe Valley Way, awesome. Trouble is, they've never built the units. In fact, the road was barely finished when they opened it. So uh, yeah, there we go. That's why it's called Coombe Valley Campers. Yes, I know there's a Coombe Valley down near Dover Way, and yes, I know there is a Coombe Valley up, near, up in Wales somewhere, um, but, we are Coombe Valley Campers, located in Hellingly in East Sussex. And that's it, I guess, for all the questions today. Everybody, thank you once again. I hope the questions have helped you today. If you want any further questions answered in the future, again, head over to our Patreon, where I'm on there every day. I'm answering your questions personally. Um, so head over there. We start the Patreon at £1 a month. If you want to be, uh, if you want to have personal guidance and assistance, that's £3 a month. And we've actually introduced some new tiers, which have got some added benefits, um, like freebies, free stickers, free hats, um, and t-shirts when they come in. So have a look at the Patreon page. We've got some increased levels now that you can be a part of. Um, don't forget, follow us on Facebook. Yes, follow us on Facebook follow us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, and yeah, if you fancy supporting the channel, go ahead and buy some stickers, buy a hat, I'm not wearing mine today, sorry about that, um, but yes, thanks again, we'll see you next time, cheers.